All right, guys, so let's continue chapter 15. So here we have a couple of uh, examples of where the wave can propagate uh, in two or three dimensions. So as you can see here, we have um, some kind of source somewhere over here. Let's call this source S. And it you know generates waves that propagate in every direction. So here we can see that we can represent those waves as sort of like, let's say, what we call wave fronts. And also we can represent them as ray diagrams. So this is especially going to be useful when we get into optics later. So here it shows that <clears throat> sort of like, let's say, those blue lines are the wave fronts representing the crest of our waves. So think like this. So this is a crest. Between them, exactly halfway is the trough. So crest, trough, crest, trough, and so on and so forth. So here in this first image, the wave propagates like that in every direction, including toward us and into the page. And sometimes it will be much easier to represent this wave as a ray diagram. So especially when we have optics and we have a light interacting with the mirrors or lenses, we're gonna see that using the ray diagram is much more um, simpler for us. Also here, what we have is assuming that source is really, really far away. So then those, uh, those wave fronts, when they reach some you know, position really far away, they basically move pretty much parallel to one another. This will be thing like this. So if you kind of go like this, like this, like this, like this, eventually they become parallel. Assuming the source is like infinitely far away or really far away. So then those wave fronts are parallel to one another and the ray diagram always goes perpendicular to those wave fronts. So this is known as a propagation of a wave. So instead of representing a wave, you know, like let's say I don't know, visual description of, a, of this particular wave, we can use wave fronts and uh, those ray diagrams, more like a geometric representation of that. And you can see here when the light reflects or refracts, propagates to other side, sometimes it's easier to represent it in terms of a ray diagram. So like, let's say more geometric representation of that. So for example, there is a wave moving like this, hits the surface and bounces back. So to see, you know, true change in direction, how it reflects back and in which direction it reflects back, ray diagrams is much simpler to use. Now, what we do here is we use the, the surface. This is some kind of boundary where the, the light, uh, which is could be also a sound, right? The sound, you know, is, you know, sound or a light. So some kind of wave. When it reaches sort of like, let's say, for example, for example, it reaches this point P, which is, when it hits this boundary line, that means, you know, that beyond that point P, right, is some kind of surface it cannot penetrate. So then reflects back. So sort of like a fixed point. So when it reflects back, we can then take this normal to represent perpendicular, sort of like imaginary perpendicular line uh, with respect to the surface, always perpendicular to the surface then the direction of the incident ray, that means incoming you know, wave uh, represented as a ray, uh, as an angle theta i, which is incident i, theta i for the incident. So theta i with respect to the normal. We don't take the angle with respect to the surface, but with respect to the normal line, which is perpendicular to the surface. Again, so this is being the surface and then normal is perpendicular to that then theta i represents the angle at which the incident you know, ray reaches that point P. So then it reflects back. And when it reflects back, we can measure the reflected angle again with respect to the normal. So then what we will see here is, according to the law of reflection, those angles will always be the same. Theta r and theta i will always be the same. That means whenever the wave is reflecting, its angle of reflection always same as angle of incident. Okay, so this is gonna be very useful, especially later on, but this is known as the law of reflection. All right, so 
here's then the superposition principle. So the superposition principle of waves are presented um, state where those two waves are moving toward each other, or technically they can also be moving together, but at some point they overlap. So when they overlap, we get some kind of what we call interference. And it's a very specific to the waves term, interference. This interference is one way of, you know, understanding that when waves overlap, they pretty much behave differently than when two particles overlap. So think like this, you have two, I don't know, like a tennis ball moving towards each other. Well, what happens when they, you know, reach basically kind of like, you know, reach towards each other, right? And then collide. Can they go through one another? Can they occupy the same space in time? Of course not. They're gonna then, you know, collide, hit, you know, apply force on one another, and then eventually bounce back. So this is one, this is two. So one and two collide. Then two is basically, um, is, you know, because of the, some kind of action reaction forces between them, right? Is bounced off to the same direction it came from. And then same thing with the, with the one. So that means they cannot go through one another. They cannot occupy same space in time. So they're gonna go move toward each other, collide and bounce back. Well, waves don't do that. Waves, when you have two waves moving toward one another, either, you know, same amplitude or opposite amplitude, the instant when they overlap, they generate a new wave. Okay, so this is what we call interference. They interfere to generate a new wave. Okay, so this is known as a superposition principle that when two waves pass through the same point, the displacement is the arithmetic sum of the individual displacements. So for example, plus two, plus two, they overlap, they superimpose a new wave of amplitude, which is algebraic sum of both of those, so plus four. Now what happens afterwards? Well, afterwards, this first wave continues moving with amplitude one, second wave, which is the second one over here, continues moving with the same amplitude as before. It's like nothing happened. Only the instant when they overlap, they superimpose a new wave. Well, here you have plus two, here you have minus two, same thing happens. The instant that when they overlap, they generate their superimpose a new wave. So where's that new wave? Well, it has zero amplitude because plus two plus minus two equals zero. And that's the amplitude of the new wave, which means that there's nothing there. At that instant, there's nothing there. Afterwards, you know, they continue like nothing happened. Okay. So this interference, you can say you get, you get two things. One, you, have, you maximize, the other one, you basically completely cancel. So we have two different names for those. Here, since the wave cancel each other, we call it destructive. This destructive interference. Here where they superimpose and you know add up to one another, so generate a larger amplitude, you know, let's say wave. This is known as a constructive. Constructive interference. So you can say right? destructive interference and constructive interference. So those are basically the two extremes. Two extremes when two positive amplitude, right, reach, and this represents the instant when, think like this. So, for, you know, the first one and second one, they, you have, you have ampli uh, the crest of one and then the, then the crest of the second one. So crest and crest, could be trough and trough. So then you have a constructive interference. When you have a crest of one with the trough of the other one, or the trough of the other one with the crest of the other one, then you get destructive. Because in a way you can have crest of one and some parts of the other one where not really crest or a trough. So here you get sort of like partial, you know, interference. But these are, let's say, destructive and constructive are the two extremes. Okay. All right, so I have a simulation. I want to quickly show you that, you know, in terms of this particular phenomenon. All right, so this is what we have. So you can see, right? So let's say you have two waves moving toward each other. And um, I have amplitude of the first one 
plus three amplitude of this, you know, let, let's call this first, let's call this second, right? So one and two. So, and what we have here is they're moving towards each other. So they were moving towards each other. You have then two crests. So you can see, right? The instant they overlap, they generate a new wave. And you can see the amplitude is larger than individual ones. So from here, we can see that, let's say if we go and kind of like a slower here, so you can see how they, you know, those blue and orange, you know, waves, right? Generate a new wave. The instant they overlap, see, when you have almost like a crest and a crest, so the instant when they have a crest and a crest on top of one another, you get maximum. And after that, you get partial interference until eventually they continue moving on their you know, original path. You can even look at it in terms of, um, let's say, plus two and minus something, for example. So then they kind of destroy each other. And then if they have both of them minus three, we can see that instant that they are overlapping, look at the blue, uh, the blue and orange. See, you have then almost a crest and a trough. So when exactly the instant when you have a crest and a trough, see, they completely destroy each other. All right, so you basically get that. We can also see this from this one over here, where you have you know two traveling waves. And this one kind of shows the instant. So let's say here, if I try to show you, see, uh, you have a crest, crest. So this one in a way represents, you know, two crests. You have then trough, trough, you know, two traps, something like that. So you get basically, you know, sort of like a constructive, so sort of like, like, like that. And this is because waves, they have, they have same amplitude, right? And both have a positive amplitude, you know, pos you know both same wavelength and positive amplitude. So, um, and it, you know, we can change, let's say same direction. You kind of get this and then we can change some of the things. So you can see how they're, you know, change the wavelengths, you know, changes how it, you know, interferes. And then you can kind of look at those waves together. So you can see, right, they're constantly, you know, interfering one or another. So that's basically what waves generally do. All right. Let's go back here. Okay. So again, so we have constructive interference where two waves are overlapping such that crest and crest, trough and crest, trough, trough and trough overlaps. So this is constructive interference. And then you have destructive interference where they completely destroy each other because you have a crest and a trough, trough and a crest, something like that, where you have crest, crest, trough, trough. You know, they always give you constructive interference. And this is somewhere again, somewhere in between, right? Partially, you know, destructive, everything like that. So. Uh, you have crest of this one and the crest of that one overlap somewhere over there. So you get something you can see, right? Lower, um, lower amplitude, but not exactly completely destroying each other. But, you know, this superimposed is actually as a lower amplitude than individual waves, sort of. Okay, so then we can use this idea to see how waves on the string can generate what we call standing waves, okay, and resonances. So the standing wave is you take a string, you fix at one end, so at this end it is fixed. So we call it we call it a node, and then we start oscillating. So start like you know, uh, vibrating. So as you start oscillate, then you can create, you know, sort of like a a wave that goes hits the boundary point, nowhere to go. It's a fixed point, so it reflects back. Okay. So now if you have a some kind of specific frequency, then we call it like frequency one. So you get that shape. You basically get one maximum point and you know two nodes, so technically. So let me use N for a node and A for the anti-node. So you get basically a one anti-node or one segment. You start oscillating faster, that means higher frequency. Then you get you know two anti-nodes. So two anti-nodes, so one anti-node, another one anti-node and three nodes. So two anti-nodes and three nodes. And what we get here is you basically can continue oscillating 
and you know faster and faster right that means higher frequency as you increase frequency you can see right three in a way represents the number of antinodes that i have so that's why i have f1 one antinode f2 two antinodes f3 three antinodes and every time higher frequency gives you more segments right or uh, what we call mod numbers and also uh, higher antinodes again one thing one thing we can see is that number of nodes always going to be one larger so this will be then in terms of um, n minus one for the, like, let's say number of anti nodes is equal to number of, so number of nodes equals number of anti nodes plus one. So always like that. All right, so then what we have here is in terms of then this particular, uh, let's say example, uh, what we get here is those known, those are known as harmonics. So this first shape is known as a first harmonic. Second shape is known as a second harmonic. And then the third harmonic and so on and so forth. So we're gonna see that in a little bit. But the idea is that nodes are points where the string is not oscillating. You get a distractive interference there because you have two waves, right? One going to the right, the other one going to the left. So nodes are points where you have distractive uh, you know, interference anti nodes where you have a constructive interference. So you have the maximum amplitude, nodes are no amplitude, and technically they are motionless, you know, in terms of as far as the wave is, you know, uh, is concerned. All right, so to then represent mathematical equation or mathematical way of looking at this. So you have two waves, right? One is going to the right, and here's the equation for that a sine kx minus omega, omega, uh, omega t, which is the equation for the traveling wave, an equivalent wave traveling to the left, the one that reflects back. So a sine kx plus omega t, remember plus minus indicates direction, minus indicates to the right, plus indicates to the left. All right, so what we do from here and then we just basically um, add those two together, add those two together. So when we add those waves together, that means wave going to the right plus wave going to the left. So we have then A sine KX minus omega T plus A sine KX plus omega T. What we're going to be doing here is basically using one of those identities. So let's say sine A plus B, which is equals to sine A cosine B plus sine B cosine A, for example. And then sine of A minus B is equals to sine A cosine B minus sine B cosine A. Now imagine if you're adding those together, right? If you add those together, so sine B cosine A minus sine B cosine A, they will cancel each other. And those two will combine and give you two, basically sine B cosine A, okay? That means what we end up with this. So we end up with one term where there is, remember for us, this is, uh, this is A, Kx, and this is B, omega t. So we end up with the answer as two cosine of Kx, then sine of omega t. Okay, where we take then this two cosine of Kx, and we'll present that as the amplitude of the superposition, you know, wave, right? So two A, well, there was, there was, there's also a factor of A. Uh, so 2A, because we have that A over there, which was a kind of like a coefficient, right? So I forgot to put that over there, right? So right there. So 2A sine KX, and then 2A cosine omega T. So in, in terms of like, let's say that basically becomes our, our equation. Okay, so this is our amplitude, 2A sine KX, 
All right, sorry, again, I actually made a mistake here. It's two sine A cosine B. That's what survives. So actually sine is Kx and omega is, uh, the cosine is omega T. There we go. So that's why sine, uh, the, the sine is with terms of Kx, uh, cosine is in terms of omega T. So then what we end up with is this. So amplitude is the maximum, which is from this equation, uh, when sine Kx equals one. Okay, so sine Kx equals one, then it, you know this entire term is basically one and you get 2A, which is the maximum amplitude. So that's why you get maximum amplitude. So that's basically the, you know, the instant when this sine of kx equals one, okay? And obviously then when sine of kx equals zero, then you get no amplitude. So that's where you have those nodes. So sine of kx are these positions, sine of kx equals zero are these positions, sine of kx equals one, sine of kx equals zero. All right, so then kind of put, put everything together. So what we have is this, right? So you have dx comma t equals a, which is the amplitude cosine omega t, where again, we just take amplitude to be in terms of 2a sine kx. Now, why are we taking this sort of like out and making it in a way a constant that, you know, kind of like goes back and forth between, you know, zero and one, right? So technically, or zero to 2a. That's basically, it's a standing wave, right? So the, the wave doesn't really travel. So like, let's say if you can think of it like this. So if you can, uh, if you have a standing wave, then it's trapped, it just goes back and forth and it's trapped, just oscillate up and down. But it, you know, then this cosine omega t term, you know, gives us sort of like, let's say uh, as a function of time, right? How the shape is changing as a function of time. Because once you have a node, another node for the same frequency, they never change the position. So if you're not changing frequency, this node is not gonna appear here or there anymore. It's always gonna be here. This node always gonna be here. And you can always think of it like this. Uh, the nodes will occur, x equals m lambda over two. Okay. Because one of the things we have here is you get constructive interference when you take you know, the position, right? You know, let's say generally delta r, which is the path length to be m times lambda and destructive when it is m plus one half times lambda. So, you know, those are in terms of like what you can get in terms of constructive and destructive interferences. All right, so then here's a little more, you know, um, closer look at the standing waves on a string. So we're gonna, you know, that was kind of like a general for standing waves. So in this chapter, we're gonna talk about standing waves on a string. Next chapter, you know, uh, standing waves for the sound. So we're gonna look at, you know, open and closed tubes, but here we're just looking at the standing waves on a string. So you have a string of length L, and then as you start, you know, let's say plug it and I said, I'm making it oscillate. Then what we can have here is we can have, you know, what we call a fundamental or first harmonic. That means this is the lowest frequency standing waves we can get. And then, you know, as the frequency starts increasing, then you can get the second harmonic or the first overtone. It's first overtone because it comes first after the harmonic. So the fundamental is known as a first harmonic. First overtone is basically the first coming after the fundamental. So that's why second harmonic is always the first overtone. Third harmonic is the second overtone. And what we have here is you can also see how the length related to the wavelength. So this is only half of the shape because this is like a shape of a full wave. And, but in this length L, you only see half of that. So then L is equals to one half the wavelength. Generally the equation is this. So wavelength, you know, in terms of N, N representing what we call sort of like a mode number and representing sort of like, let's say anti-nodes or the segments. So lambda n is equals to 2L over n. That's the equation for the wavelength. So you can see, right, when n equals one, so then lambda one is equals to 2L divided by one. So, well, let me put like L like this. 
So 2L over 1 or just 2L, okay? Which means L is equals to half a wavelength, like that. So this is how you can use the number of segments here. This number of segment is 2, N equals 2. Oops. So there's 1 and 2. Here's N equals 3. So that's why N, this N is also like a number of harmonics, okay? So first harmonic, second harmonic, and third harmonic. The first one is known as a fundamental. So the fundamental and f of one frequency for the fundamental, you can find using the equation for the uh, speed of the wave, which is, if you remember, speed equals wavelength times frequency. So frequency, let's say, is equals to speed divided by wavelength. But since wavelength has this equation, 2L over N, you can rearrange, becomes N times V over 2L. So then this is the equation for the frequency of ascending waves. N is the number of harmonics or number of modes, right? Then V velocity divided by 2L. Okay, so here's that equation for the wavelength, N equals one, two, three. So you can use that length technically of the string along with the number of anti notes or the harmonics you see to calculate the wavelength. And then frequency is basically n times v over 2l. So here's what I can do. So if n is equals to 1, so n is 1, so it becomes v over 2l. And then when, for example, n equals f for the second harmonic, f2, so this is equal to then when n equals 2, so it becomes 2v over 2l. When f equals 3, becomes 3v over 2l. But if I separate this v over 2l, v over 2l, I can see that v over 2l is just first harmonic or the fundamental. That means f of n is equals to then, just like here, this becomes two times f1, this becomes three times f1. So f of n equals n times f of one, which is once you have harmonic, your first harmonic frequency, second is double. The third one is triple the first harmonic frequencies. All right, so let's look at a few examples. So figure below shows a standing wave on a two meter long string that has been fixed at both ends and tightened until the wave speed is 40 meters per second. What is the frequency for the standing wave as you see in the, in the figure? Well, we're given that the length is two meters and then the speed is 40 meters per second. Now, how do we find the frequency? Well, I know that frequency is equals to n v over 2 l. So we have v, we have l. The next we just find n and we can say right, it's one, two, three, four, five. So n is equals to five. So then I can say f of five is equals to five times v over 2 l. So it's five times 40 meters per second divided by two times two meters. And I can basically calculate for, the, for this particular frequency. But in this case, we get 50 Hertz. There you go. All right, so let's look at another example. Here we have a standing wave on a one meter long string that is fixed at both ends are seen as successive frequencies of 36 Hertz and 48 Hertz. What are the fundamental frequency, oh, what are the fundamental frequency and the wave speed? Draw the standing wave pattern when the string oscillates at 48 Hertz. All right, so first we need to, you know, we, we're given that there's a, you know, standing waves on a one meter long, you know, string. So, so we're given length as one meter. So one meter long string. And it says um, there are successive frequencies of 36, Hertz and 48 Hertz, okay. Which means that those are, those frequencies come one after another. Okay, so let's call this F of A, which is 36 Hertz. And this is some M times F of one, right? So some M times F of one, where F one is the fundamental frequency. Okay. Uh, next one, which is 48, we can say F of B, is equals to 48 Hertz. And this is equals to, so technically whatever this M is, right? It's gonna be M plus one. 
times f of one because they are successive frequencies. So if this is five, m is five, then, you know, so a is five, then b is six, right? Whatever it is. So that means just one, the next one, right? So the next, you know, uh, harmonic. All right. So generally then what we can do for, for something like this, uh, sometimes just the ratio approach is the best, okay? So part A says, what are the fundamental frequency and the wave speed? So let's look at, you know, in terms of fundamental frequency, because here's where we already have the fundamental frequency formation over there. So, and we have the FA and FB, right? So we can just basically rearrange, first find, let's say, what is the M order? And then we can then find the frequency. For that, we do ratio, f of b over f of a. We know then f of b is 48 hertz. f of a is 36 hertz. Also, f of b is m plus 1 f1. f of a is m times f1. All right, so here we can see that I can just cancel f of one. And on the right side, I have m plus one over m, which is equals than 48 over 36. But if I do 48 over 36, I get four thirds. So all I have to do is just rearrange so that three times m plus one is equals to four times m. I just cross multiply. Then from here, I just go ahead and, you know, uh, so for M, right? Because it's, you know, I get then three M plus three equals four M, then move the, you know, three M to the other side. So then I end up M equals three. That means when I have 36 Hertz, that's when I have my third harmonic, M equals three. All right, now that I have this, then I can say that F, F3 is equal to three times F1, or I can say then, since this has become an F4, right? F4 is equal to four times F1 and use either one of them to solve for F1. So F1 is equal to, for example, F3 over three. F3 was 36 Hertz divided by three. So I get 12 Hertz. So that's my fundamental frequency. Then to get the wave's speed, uh, then I can just use this, right? F of one is equals to V over two L. That means V is equals to two L times F. We can just get it from here as well, right? So speed is equals to two times one meter times 12 Hertz, which is one per second, right? So then what we get here is two times one times 12, so 24 meters per second. Right. So that's the you know, second part of part A. Then it says, draw the standing wave pattern when the string oscillated 48 hertz. Well, I know that that's 48 hertz. Then my M here is equals to uh, six, sorry, four, right? So that's equals to four because remember M is equals to three and at 48 is M plus one, which is four. So then what it means here is this. When I have M equals four, I need to have three antinodes. Oh, sorry, four antinodes, because M is always the same number as antinodes. So that means, you know, I'm gonna have five nodes, then there's gonna be one node, second one, third one, fourth one, and fifth one. Then I need to have a shape like this, right? That means, you know, five shapes. Oh, sorry, four, four segments, right? And five nodes. So just kind of like easier to just do this, this one like this. All right, so that's basically my, you know, where well, this is the length L, right? And this is the length of one wave. Okay. All right, so that's basically this problem over here. Here's another one. You have a 75 gram bungee cord has an equilibrium length of 1.2 meters. The cord is stretched to a length of 1.8 meters, then vibrated at 20 Hertz. This produces a standing waves with two antinodes. What is the string constant of the bungee cord? All right, so let's see what I have. So in terms of 
kind of see the visual, you know, presentation of this example like this. So you have a bungee cord, which is 1.2 meter long, 75 grams, and then it's stretched to a length of 1.8 meters. That means it is stretched by additional 0.6 meters. So then the total length is 1.8, you know, and then vibrate at 20 Hertz. Okay. So you can see, right, in order for us to stretch it, we have to apply some kind of tension force, which is gonna be exactly equals to the spring restoring force, which is K times delta L, right? So all of those things are actually gonna be important when we calculate this. So when we're stretching, right, then basically we know that the tension is responsible for, or, you, know, you know, allows us to then uh, relate the speed of the wave to the linear mass density. Okay, now what we're given here is in terms of the length 1.2 meters, but then it is stretched to 1.8 meters and produces standing wave to two antinodes. That means two antinodes, n equals two. Okay, and since n equals two, and for us, then the length is equals to 1.8 meters, then I can find the wavelength, remember. Lambda, lambda n is equals to um, two n over two l over n, two l over n. So lambda two, since n is equals to two, is equals to two l divided by two. Two is cancel. Then lambda is equal to the l. That means wavelength is same as my length. Then we are told that it vibrates at 20 Hertz. Okay, it's vibrates at 20 Hertz. Now, the question is, remember, it's asking where's the spring constant of the bungee cord? Now, how do we find spring constant? Well, as I said, right, this tension related to the K delta L. That means T minus F spring is equals to zero because you hold, you know, you stretch it and then you're holding and then just vibrating. That means you, you're maintaining that you know, stretch distance. That means T minus F of S equals zero. That means T is equals to F of S. And F of S is K times Delta L. Well, which means K is equals to tension divided by Delta L. Well, I have Delta L is 0.6, but then I don't have the tension. Well, that's what I, what, I, what I need, you know, to find a wavelength. And I have then the frequency because I know there's the equation speed is equal to square root of, you know, uh, so technically thing like this. So this is F of T, let me put it like that. F of T, the tension force. That's the notation we use. So, so the speed is equals to F of T divided by mu. Okay. So that's why we're given the mass of the cord as well. Because from here, if I square both sides, then V square is equals to F of T over mu, or F of T is equals to mu times V square. All right, so mu is mass per length. It's mass per length. And um, V is, well, frequency times wavelength. So you can see, right? That's why what I have here is uh, I can just, for F of T, you know, put it this over here. So it's gonna be M over L, then times frequency times wavelength. And I just said wavelength is L, so like that, All right? That means I can just calculate this, plug in all the values, right? So, you know, uh, in terms of making sure that I am, you know, let's say calculating all the values in terms of converted to meters, Converted to gram, uh, kilograms, right? But once I plug in those values, I should get 90 newtons per meters. Okay. So 0 0.075 and you know 1.5, right? All of those things. And I'm plugging and calculate this, and this is what we get: 90 newtons per meters. All right, so one of the things we have here in the last few slide is just some more like a, a optional slide because we're going to be covering this in greater details later on 
when we cover optics. So in this slide, what we have here is what happens when the light actually is propagating into the another medium. So let's say what we have here is, is medium one and water, let's say is medium two, let's say light goes from air to water. So here we have incident light represented as a ray hits this point P, but point P is actually such a boundary line that allows light to, you know, or, you know, light or sound to propagate to the other side. But when the light goes to the other side, two things happen. Taking V1 to be velocity of the sound in medium one, V2 to be velocity of the, let's say wave in medium two, you know, velocity of wave in medium one, velocity of wave in medium two, theta I is the incident. So we can call this technically theta one. This is, let's call this theta two, which is the angle that the, the wave makes with the uh, in medium two. Then this ratio of speed of wave in medium two divided by speed of wave in medium one is related to the sine of theta two over sine of theta one. This is actually known as a Snell's law. So we'll talk about that in much greater detail later on. So this is known as a Snell's law and it represents that because wave gonna have a smaller angle, you can see, right? A smaller angle, theta two, well, then V2 will also change. V2, generally, if it goes from more, less dense into more dense, then velocity will decrease. That means when every time the wave goes, you know, let's say from one way, from one medium to another, it can actually change. Well, let, let, me, not, let me put this like this. So it's not necessarily always gonna decrease. So it's gonna change. Let me put it like this. It's not gonna be equal to one another, okay? Because, to say that you know, the, the, the speed of wave will decrease would be wrong because for example, for light, it does decrease. For sound, it actually increases. Sound travels faster in water than in air because much more dense molecules. Remember the, for the sound, the molecules, right? They are the you know, energy carriers and there are much more density, more molecules. So it's actually moving faster. And it's actually moving about four times faster in water, three to four times faster in water. So that's why then, you know, in a way, one of the things we have here is there is this equation that gives us how the, you know, the sound or air or the, the sound, the light or any type of other wave will change its speed and its, you know, direction when it goes from one medium to another, depending on the um, density of those materials. So this is known as a law of refraction. You can write the words both ways. Wave going from a slower medium to faster one would follow the red line in the other direction. So that means you can go from uh, slower medium to the faster one or from faster medium to the slower one. That means in either way, you can kind of like look at it in terms of what happens. Okay. And the last thing kind of what we have here is what we call diffraction. And again, this, so this is something that um, related to the wave when you can see right here's the wave let's say moving in this direction and there's some kind of barrier, right? And you can see right there's sort of like a, this shadow effect. That's what we call a diffraction, right? So whenever they encounter some kind of obstacle. So um, that's why let's say when you, uh, you have some kind of you know, uh, I don't know, column or something like that, you see behind it, there's like a shadow, right? Uh, because the light cannot propagate through the, you know, the column, right? So then the obstacle, so then you get, you get sort of like, let's say, absence of a wave right over there, a little bit over the wave effect. So this is known as a diffraction, okay? And the idea is that the amount of diffraction depends on the size of the obstacle compared to the wavelength, okay? So the obstacle is much smaller than the wavelength. The wave is barely affected. So you can see, right? So here those obstacles are small. So then it seems like, it seems like barely affected. But then when the obstacle is large, it is basically compared to the wavelength. So see, this is the wavelength and this is the obstacle. So this is the wavelength, this is the obstacle. When the obstacle is small compared to the wavelength, very little effect. But when the obstacle is large compared to the wavelength, then it's much greater effect, diffraction effect. Wait, see, this is diffraction effect compared here and in the, another slide. All right, so that's it for this chapter. <laughs>